Right guys, how's it going? Welcome back. Today I'm back in my own car, a car many of you will be familiar with. It's my 2013 Range Rover Vogue SE. I've owned this car for around 18 months and I've just done 20,000 miles in it. I bought it with 52,000 miles on and I've just hit 72. So I thought this was the perfect time to do a quick update video. I get asked all the time to do this kind of update video on the Range Rover. Presumably because it's a Land Rover product, you'll assume that I could film content with it every week, every time something breaks. But in reality, that just hasn't been the case. It's been one of the most reliable cars I've ever owned. It's never left me stranded. I've never had to call out the AA. It's never even pinged on an engine light. I've driven it through France, Spain. I use it every day, drive it exactly how I like. And it's been pretty reliable. I've never personally owned a car for as long as this. It's without doubt the best car I've ever owned. It's been superb. I mean, I don't pamper it. I don't drive it as if it were made of glass. And yet, it's never really put a foot wrong. I've recently had to attend a couple of meetings down in London at pretty short notice and, well, due to the fact that I'm allergic to trains, I've jumped in this both times and it's just been effortless. Both times I've just got in it and done a 450 mile round trip. Not once has it crossed my mind that I might not actually get there. It's the perfect car to do that kind of journey in because you sit there at 70-ish miles an hour and it's as if you're not moving at all. Thanks to its double glaze and its clever sound deadening, it's as quiet as a mute mouse in a morgue. The best thing is when you actually arrive at your destination, you don't feel fatigued and the car still looks the part. It looks the part wherever it goes. It has adaptive cruise control, so not only will it maintain your speed like standard cruise control, but it will also brake for you if somebody pulls out in front of you. I love the interior, it's just so comfortable. I love the feel of the steering wheel. I love the fact the steering wheel's heated, as are the seats, and cooled. I love the cup holders. The sound system's superb. I also love driving this in winter because the headlights are excellent. Again, they're adaptive so they bend around corners to give you the best view of the road ahead. Something else that's very clever, if you're driving this on a dark road, it will automatically turn on your full beam. And then it'll sense if a car's approaching and turn them back to dipped. You really don't have to think about an awful lot when you drive a Range Rover. It's all just too good for words. I'm privileged in my job to be able to drive lots of different cars, from Bentleys, Aston Martins, new Audis, Mercedes, BMWs, and I can honestly say, after filming with any of those cars, at the end of the day when I jump back in this, I think to myself, this is just better. This is better in every way. Not once have I ever filmed with anything and then got back in this and thought, I really miss that car I've just filmed with. That never happens. Yes, all right, some of the cars I film with might be faster, lighter, they might handle better, but this does a pretty good job of everything. This is the best all-rounder without a doubt. You can drive anything else that you might think is better than Range Rover, but I can categorically tell you that it isn't. The full-size Range Rover is a car that can do it all with the comfort of a five-star hotel and the practicality of a, of a double garage. I don't wish to sound sycophantic, but they are quite simply the best cars in the world. Now, if you wish to drive the best car in the world, then you have to be prepared for higher running costs than a Toyota Corolla. Most sensible people can understand that that goes without saying. The first cost you need to bear in mind is road tax. Now, here in the UK, we pay an annual road tax, and that's worked out on the car's CO2 output. Because the government deemed the Range Rover a high polluter, this is in one of the highest brackets of £585 a year, which is £585 more than a Toyota Igo. So the cost for 18 months road tax is £877.50. Your next biggest cost is fuel. Unfortunately, here in the UK, we're not sat on vast oil fields, so it will set you back around £1.40 per litre. Happily, this 4.4 litre SDV8 is quite economical. Seriously. Meandering around town, I never see it drop below 26 miles per gallon. And if you drive it sensibly on a motorway run, you'll get 35 or 36. Which, I don't want to sound out of touch, but I think that's incredible for a car of this size and weight. Even if, say, you're late to a meeting in our capital city, and you put your foot down a bit and you're doing, I don't know, say 90 miles an hour, it'll still do 27 miles per gallon. So I'm told. Let's work out the rough fuel cost for 20,000 miles then here in England. I'll base it off an average of 28 miles per gallon. 20,000 miles divided by 28 is 714 gallons of fuel used. The average cost of a gallon of fuel is about £6.35. So that gives us a rough total of fuel used for 20,000 miles of £4,533, there or thereabouts. You might recall from my first update video that I did after 10,000 miles that I bought an extended Land Rover warranty, which sent me back £1,500 a year. 
Now, when that expired back in July, I think, I renewed it for another year at £1,500. That £1,500 a year warranty is a big expense, but it's already paid for itself, so it was definitely money well spent. And the good thing is, it just means I drive this now however I like, and it gives me some peace of mind that when something breaks, or if something breaks, it's not really my problem. If I work out the cost for 18 months of that Land Rover warranty, that comes to £2,250. Next up are the juicy bits that you've been waiting for, all of the things that have gone wrong. This isn't actually a very long list, but after I did my 10,000 mile video update, last winter I noticed that the heated windscreen wasn't working. Only half of it would defrost. Annoyingly, it wasn't the driver's side either. It was due its annual service back in February, so I booked it in at Guy Salmon Land Rover in Stockport. So while it was there, I asked them to look at a few things, one of which was the windscreen. It turned out to be faulty heating elements in the windscreen itself, so that was replaced under warranty. The old windscreen had a chip in it anyway, which I picked up driving through France, my little pesky French stone. That was all covered under warranty, and from then on it's been perfect. The next thing I asked them to check over was one of the headlights. I think it was that side. You turn on your lights at night, and occasionally that one wouldn't come on, which was quite dangerous. A couple of months before that, I'd had the bulb replaced at my local workshop with an aftermarket bulb, and that cost me about £120 for a bulb. But it turned out that aftermarket bulb wasn't very good. So Land Rover replaced it with a proper Land Rover bulb. That was all done while it was in there for its service, and since then it's been faultless. So there's a quick tip for you. If one of your bulbs goes, make sure you replace it with a genuine one, rather than a snide aftermarket. Whilst it was at Land Rover having its service, they did a free vehicle health check and they informed me that one of the turbos was leaking. I didn't even know about this. It never brought on an engine light, it drove fine, it didn't smoke excessively. I really didn't know I had an issue there. But anyway, they identified an oil leak coming from one of the turbos, and I couldn't quite believe this, but they replaced it under warranty. Now that job would have cost me several thousand pounds, and they just did it as part of the warranty. That total bill from Land Rover for a full service and a new bulb came to £973.52. Next up was its MOT. I'd noticed that all four tyres were getting a little bit low, so I replaced them with four new matching Pirellis. And for its MOT, it needed a couple of CV boots replacing. On top of that was the £40 MOT test, so the total for four new Pirelli tyres, CV boots, and the MOT test was £1,086. I noticed a couple of months after that, if you were to go over a bumpy road, the suspension would clunk. So I took it back down to my local garage, and it needed the front control arms and the rear bottom arms replacing. They were quite expensive, so that bill came to £732. Next up, and this will show my minor OCD, the start-stop button was a little bit worn and discoloured. It just looked a little bit tatty. So I ordered one from Guy Salmon in Stockport, and that cost me £46, and was a doddle to fit. The next thing I had done was a gearbox service. Now, long-time viewers of this channel will know that I'm slightly obsessed with getting automatic gearboxes serviced. That's just because manufacturers generally lie to us and tell us that they're sealed for life, and they aren't. It's a serviceable item, just like anything else, and the fluid needs changing. So, because this car was, I don't know, seven, eight years old, and it never had one done, I took it to my local automatic gearbox centre, and paid £210 plus VAT to have some fresh fluid and a fresh filter put on. That's something that's done now, and will last for another six, seven, or eight years. Another minor thing that I had to replace was the driver's door check strap. It was starting to make an annoying clicking noise, Anyone that's ever driven a, a Peugeot or Citroen will know exactly what I'm talking about. That was only £19. I don't know if you're keeping a tally of this, so I'll just give you a quick update. The first 10,000 miles, excluding fuel, road tax and warranty, cost me £3,222. That was just in repairs and maintenance. If we add in the £10,770 for 20,000 miles worth of fuel, road tax, warranty and this year's servicing and repair bills, that brings us to... £13,992, which, now I've added it all up, does make me feel slightly sick. But let's remain positive. If I divide that £13,992 by the 20,000 miles, that gives us an average of around 69 pence a mile for everything. 69 pence a mile to drive the best car on the road. It's not too bad, is it? Now I've had an L405 Range Rover in my life, I can't imagine being without it. It is just the best car. It's all the car anyone could possibly need, or want. If you're thinking of buying one, I wouldn't be too put off by those costs, because anything you drive will cost you money in fuel, repairs, and maintenance. If I were to replace this with, I don't know, an Audi A8 or an S-Class Mercedes, I might get an extra 10 miles per gallon from it, 
but I, th I still think the repairs and everything are still going to be the same sort of cost. My advice if you are thinking of buying one is go for a 4.4 turbo diesel V8, not the 3 litre. Also look for one with excellent service records, one that's been looked after and not one that's been pimped up or blinged up too much. I've never kept a car for as long as this and to be honest with you that's how I got into buying and selling cars in the first place, just because I would get bored with my own car. So I would try and fix it up and sell it every couple of months. Every time I fancy a change or fancy a different car, I have a quick look on Autotrader and there's nothing there that really, really turns me on. Only perhaps a newer version of this, like a 2018 with the different grille and different lights and the virtual dash. So perhaps I might look for one of those in the near future. Anyway, I hope that's been helpful for you. So thank you once again for watching. Make sure you give the video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Make sure you subscribe if you haven't done already. You can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I'll leave the link below. Check out my merch on highpeakstore.co.uk. And yeah, cheers guys. I'll see you next time.